Welcome church, Paul says in the book of Philippians, we press in towards the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Christ is our prize. Come on. Little by little, I've seen your glory as I look into your eyes. Moment by moment, I'm living to know you and I leave all else behind. In a world living upside down, you turn it right side up, you turn it right side up. Nothing better than the love I found. I'm dancing in your life, I'm dancing in your life. Just nothing else can satisfy. You are the prize, you are the prize. You're all I want for my whole life. You are the prize, you are the prize. Jesus forever, I want your presence What compares to who you are Nothing can stop me, I'm chasing you only God, I'm clinging to your heart In a world living upside down You turn it right side up, you turn it right side up Nothing better than the love I find I'm dancing in your light I'm dancing in your light Cause nothing else can satisfy You are the price You are the price You're all I want for my whole life You are the price You are the price Come on! You are the price Nothing but Jesus. You are the price. You're all I want for my whole life. You are the price. You are the price. Cause nothing else can satisfy. You are the price. You are the price. You're all I want for my whole life. You are the price. You are the price. There is nothing like a power that is in the name of Jesus. His name is above, is above all dominion, above all principalities. There's a name that levels mountains. It comes on highways through the sea. And I've seen his power unravel battles. Right in front of me. Come on.
Oh, there's a faith that stands defiant It sends Goliath to his knees And I've seen his praise unravel shackles right off my feet Come on and sing, there's power in his name Cause that's the power of your name just the mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus Think there's a whole church. Oh, there's a hope that calls our courage. And in the furnace, I'm afraid. The kind of daring expectation that every prayer I make is on an empty grave. Cause that's the power. Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and storm goes breaking There is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus I will like your name. I see you taking ground. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's camp. You still do miracles. You will do what you said. For you're the same God and thou as you've always been. Your spirit breaking now, your kingdom moving in, your victory claims the ground that the enemy had. Yes, city, yes, city, you still do miracles. You will do what you said, for you're the same God now as you've always been. Cause that's the power of your name. Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and soul goes break And there is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus no power like the mighty name of Jesus On the hill in Israel Mercy spoke for me, mercy spoke for me, mercy spoke for me. It was on Golgotha's tree, his death brought liberty, his death brought liberty, oh his death brought liberty. Shed 
It is by His death I am alive Because of Christ I am alive What a humble sacrifice Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean what a blessed mystery His punishment my peace His punishment my peace Oh, His punishment my peace May I never boast In anything Except the cross of Jesus Christ May I not forget The blood He shed It is by His death I am alive May I never boast In anything Except the cross Of Jesus Christ Jesus. 
Oh, because of Jesus, we are alive today. Amen. I want to encourage us today that He is alive. He is risen. He is on the throne and He is our God. And because He's alive, you and I have the power of God to overcome in every area of our life in Jesus' Name. Come on, let's give Him one more praise. One more praise today. You know, Paul, the Apostle, he experienced the power of God working in his life and it's God's desire for you and I to experience the power that He has that can work within our lives and in our circumstances. And, and you know, Paul was able to overcome so many different hardships and battles. And, and he writes a passage to us in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And I believe it's a passage that speaks to all of us at some point in our life or with some things that we go through or experiences that we have. And he writes here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we are pressed on every side by troubles. How many of you know, sometimes we look around everywhere, all we see is troubles. The world is in trouble, the economy is in bad shape and people are needing hope. And he says, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are not abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Come on, any of you feeling you're knocked down today, you're not destroyed, amen. I wanna encourage you, you may feel like you're knocked down, but you're not knocked out in Jesus' name. And then he goes on, he says, that is why we never give up. Our spirits are being renewed every day. And then he says, for our present troubles are small and won't, won't last very long. I wanna encourage us today, because of Jesus, we can overcome because of what He's done at the cross. Maybe you're feeling knocked down today. Maybe you feel like there's troubles all around you. You're feeling discouraged, despair. I wanna say to you that through the name of Jesus, that you can rise up, that you can overcome because you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus because He defeated every enemy in Jesus' Name. I wanna pray right now. And maybe you're in the room today. And maybe you're feeling like, Man, Lord, I just need you to strengthen me. Maybe you feel like you're knocked down by life or maybe you feel like you're in a place of despair. Whatever it is, maybe you're feeling empty in your life. You know, the Bible says that Jesus said that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they will be filled. And when we come with this heart and this attitude, God, I need you to fill me, Lord. God, I need you to pick me up. Maybe you've, been, maybe you've made some mistakes or maybe things never worked out or maybe you feel like it worked. You just feel like you, and you've been crushed in every circumstance. I want to encourage us. Allow God to lift you up today. Allow His Spirit to move in your heart and in your life. And so if that's you today, maybe you need to be, you just need God to fill you. Maybe you're feeling empty or maybe you just need to be strengthened. Right where you are, why don't you just, as a sign of surrender, just raise your hands to God and open up your heart to God and allow God to fill you today. I want to encourage us. Let's have the hunger. Let's have the desire that as we pray that we're going to feel God work in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that, that you are the one who fills us, God, that, that you can fill us with strength, Lord, that you can fill us with hope, Lord, that you can fill us with your power. And so, God, right now, I pray for people, Lord, who feel like maybe they just knocked down by life. Father, I thank you that you're lifting them up, that you're picking them up. God, those that are in despair, God, that they're not destroyed, Father God. But God, I pray that you're working in every heart, every circumstance, that you renew renewing the strength, Father. God, I pray right now that all of the things that we're facing, that we can overcome them by the power of your Spirit, God. God, I pray for marriages. God, I thank you that you're healing them, Lord. Those marriages that are in trouble, Father. God, I pray that you're restoring them now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for financial breakthrough, Lord. As people are looking to you, Lord, and trusting you, Father, I pray for this now in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We declare that we have overcome because you are for us. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's give God one more praise. It's so good to be in church today. And I know that it, you've been the best place that you can possibly be. It might be a little bit cold and gloomy out there, but inside you, come on, we gathered with men and women that love God, want to experience the presence of God. No better place to be than in God's house. And I want to welcome everyone to church. Before you take your seats, why don't you do this? 
Take a few moments to connect with somebody in your section. Get to meet somebody you've never connected with before. Meet somebody you've never met before. Let's take a few moments. kicked off with powerful sessions with a variety of empowering and challenging courses alongside meaningful discussion and connection. It's been incredible as we grow together. The next round of courses start on Tuesday the 26th of April. Don't miss out. God has a different perspective of who you are as a son or daughter of God and what that means for the trajectory of your life. This course is going to teach us how to discern the wilderness season. Okay, very important. Number two, show us from scripture the appropriate behavior in the wilderness. And number three, you're gonna discover the benefits of the wilderness. But I'm pretty sure I've discovered a biblical pattern for wealth and how it's supposed to work in your life if it's gonna be a blessing. This is a biblical framework for a proper way to view wealth. When you do it this way, you're going to do it properly. Hello, everybody. Welcome to church today and welcome to everybody joining us online. So good to be in the house of God. Amen. After last weekend, which was incredible. I just want to encourage everybody, Grow Nights, our second run of courses starts this Tuesday and we just finished the first run, which was just so good. We loved um, having people growing in the house of God in a midweek environment. And so the courses that are coming up, um, you'll see them on the, the screen, Wilderness, Life, Money, Legacy, How to Deal with Money, um, God's Way. And then the I Am is um, directed to any age group, but the way it's facilitated, a young adult age group is really going to be able to connect connect and relate well to that. So um, if you want to come along in that age group, not just to grow spiritually, but also to connect with people, it's a great opportunity for you on a Tuesday night um, to come and do that course. And then we had youth on Friday night. It took me the whole of yesterday to recover. I'm clearly outside of the age group, but it was the best time spending Friday night with all of your kids. I don't know if you know, but you've got the best kids ever. They were just really incredible. Um, it was so encouraging to see their love for God, their love for the house of God, their, their spirits just being open to being directed and guided in the things of God and how they were connecting and making friends in a godly environment. We loved it and we've got it happening again this Friday night. It's not every Friday night. So you need to see what the dates are and get your kids into the house of God, best place for them to be and um, setting them up to win in this world that they're facing. And so did you have a good time on Friday night? That was awesome. Awesome. Yes. We had 480 youth in the room. It was absolutely incredible and over 50 salvations. And so I want to encourage us parents that it's the best place that we could bring. I know it's a sacrifice for you now to bring them out on a Friday night, but it's a long-term investment into their lives that will set them straight, get them position for a successful life in the things of God and so thank you to every parent who took the time out to bring your children to youth on Friday night we absolutely enjoyed it we loved it and uh, we look forward to this Friday night it's going to be absolutely amazing again and last week we had Easter and it was absolutely amazing to be back in God's house for Easter 
we haven't been able to do that since 2019 and so it was amazing that we were all gathered together we had so many people come through church over the Easter weekend but more importantly we had so many people commit their lives to God on our campus here through our seven services we had 156 people give their lives to Jesus which was absolutely amazing and plus we had 58 people who committed their life to to the Lord at our Jackson Park campus which is also incredible so in total 214 people said yes to Jesus saved find a new life and a new purpose in God and and today we baptize in the 56 people registered for water baptism in this weather which is absolutely incredible and want to want to thank every uh, person who's part of our serve team there's some of you sitting in the meeting today and some that have already been serving today that served over our Easter weekend especially on the Sunday and on the Friday getting up on a holiday and then Sunday in the rain and car park guys did incredible the disciple land were amazing I think what I think we had like nearly 15 nearly on the Friday and the Sunday uh, but in the morning and the evening Sunday we had over 2,000 children come through disciple land and that's incredible for our disciple land team and so uh, we want to thank everyone. Coffee shop, I know the coffee shop were incredible as well. I made like 924 hot drinks over the weekend. And so can I ask us to give our, all of our surf team a great hand for serving us, being a part of what God is doing. Amen. All making an eternal impact and being part of something that's so much bigger than what any one of us could do on our own. And that's what I love about the local church, that we all bring our best, but together, God just makes it into something magnificent, something beautiful that is just bigger than we could ever imagine. And not just, not numerically, we're talking about how people experience God and we get to um, deliver that in a way that is attractive. And so perhaps you're joining us today for the very first time. We love that you're here. We hope that you've already had a good time and we just want to encourage you to relax and enjoy what God has for you. We don't have any um, requirements or expectations of you. We, we expect visitors every single service, every single week. And so you're part of the reason of why we do church the way we do church, so that you could feel comfortable, that God could speak into your life, that He could put you on a journey that um, could lead to success in your life in God's way. And so we're glad that you're here. And if you are a visitor um, and you've got questions, about the church. We have a next step station in our foyer. We've got a website and an app, um, but you could let us know you're here by following the links on the screen. If you'd like someone to call you in the week and they can have a conversation with you. But more than that, I always want to invite our visitors to come back because it's a place that you just want to come back for more. One visit to Imagine Church is not enough. We want you to come back for more. And so um, we really do appreciate the fact that you've taken time out to enjoy the service today and I want to encourage all of us oh we didn't welcome them let's welcome our visitors you look like you were going to say something and I thought I must finish now because he wants to say something I know that look that husband look but anyway I'm going to finish now so you can do the offering enjoy the service there we go you all good this morning you all have a good week glad to be in God's house Come on, turn to the person next to you. Tell them, I'm so glad I'm sitting in church with you today. Uh, You know, every church is known by what they believe. And what they believe is what God is able to do in their life. And we, in our church, we believe that putting God first in everything is so important. And today, as we get ready to take up the offering and lead us into our giving segment, I want to encourage us that at Imagine Church, we believe that that everything that we have comes from God, that we believe that we would not have salvation if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have this life if it wasn't for God, because God created us in His likeness and image, He's the one who gave life to us, and everything good that we have in our life comes from God, according to Scripture, that says that all good gifts that, uh, that we experience here on earth come from the Father above, and so I want to encourage us today that that we can go through life thinking that it's all about us, and it's all about the things that we've done, or we can really have this humility about our lives which is so attractive and it really attracts the favor and the blessing of God on our life is that when we remember that everything that we have is because of God in our life and you know God was preparing the children of Israel to go into the promised land and and he says to them that when we get to this place where you start experiencing all the good things that God has done for you and all the things that you have that you remember that it all comes from God and 
And he says here, Moses writes to the children through the voice of God. And he says, do not become proud at the time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. And then he goes on and he says, remember the Lord your God. Everybody say, remember. He's saying to them, remember the Lord your God because there's going to come a time where you're going to start experiencing the blessing and the favor of God on your life. And, and it says that He is the one who gives you power to be successful. And you know, it's so easy for us, whether we're experiencing the blessing and the favor of God on our lives or we're not. Or maybe we're just in a place where everything we have, we, we, it's so easy to think that what we're doing is because of the work of our hand. It's like, I get paid the salary because I applied my skill, I put in the hours. If it wasn't for my, my knowledge or my skill set, then this wouldn't happen. And that is part of it. That's the part truth, but it's not the full truth. The full truth is, is that you can do what you can do because God enabled you to do that. And so the Bible writers are telling us that, that we need to remember God. And one of the ways we remember God is by honoring God. In our church, we believe that putting God first in every area of our finance, every area of our life, including our finances, is part of honoring God. And so when we put God first, that we're saying, God, we remember that the skill set, the ability to earn an income comes from you. It comes from your hand. It comes from your wisdom and your knowledge. And, and we believe that as we give God 10% of what we earn and what we have, then God is able to bless that 10%. And then the 90% of that's left over is blessed by God and that God can do more with the 90 than what you and I could ever do with the 100%. And I want to encourage us that we have the heart and the humility to say that everything I have comes from God and that's why we give, that's why we are able to be a, a church that's able to reach out because we remember that everything we have comes from God and our response is God, we're going to honor you because of what you've done in our life, we want you to do in other people's lives. Think about the 214 people that got saved last week. And that could have only happened through people who remember that everything they have is, comes from God. And the honoring God and giving to God and, and allowing the kingdom of God and the church to advance. And so let's pray today as we get ready to give. Father, as we give to you today, Father, we thank you, Lord, that everything that we have, Lord, comes from your hand. And so, God, we want to honor you today through our giving, Lord. I pray that you bless every person, you provide for them, and you protect them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, are you ready for God's Word today? You're ready to receive? I want to encourage you to open up your heart to God. Open your, up your heart to His Word today. I believe that as we teach God's Word today, I believe God is wanting to speak truth into our life and wants to reveal the nature of who He is and the nature of the Father God and, and who Jesus is and, and our approach to God. And, and not only our approach to God, but our approach to humanity and our approach to the people that, that God has placed in our, in our world. And so I want to read a passage found, to, found in Luke chapter 19. And Jesus is on his way to Jer Jericho. And the scripture starts here in Luke chapter 19 verses 1. It says that Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. And he was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. And he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quickly come down. Come down, I must be a guest in your home today. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. How many of you know when God starts working in people's lives, not everybody's happy about it. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, God, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people of their taxes, I will give them four times as much. Can anybody agree with me that this should be a scripture in SARS? I think we would be, anyway, let me carry on. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Father, as we come to your word today, God, we thank you for your word, Lord. God, I pray that your word is alive and it's active, Father God, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, God, I pray today that as we hear your word, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts, you would speak into our lives, Father. And God, I pray that you would meet people right where they are, in Jesus' name, amen. 
Have you ever received a, an invitation to a, a distinguished event, a, an event that, that maybe just a few people have been invited to and, and you happen to be one of those lucky people that have been invited to this special occasion where you realize that not everybody else has been invited. And when you get this invitation, you realize that you must be somebody of significance or somebody who's special to the host because, because you've been invited to this occasion or this event that maybe other people haven't been invited to. And you know, this is what happens when we, we get invited to a, a, a an auspicious occasion or a special event is that we feel honored. We feel like we've been included when others haven't been included, or we feel special that, that we got this invitation to this specific event. This is what happens to us when, uh, when, this, when we get invited, because the opposite is true, is that sometimes we, we have a friend, and, and because we have a friend, and, and we, this friend is connected to another friend, and, and maybe somebody gets, uh, extends an invite to a friend that, that both of you know, they get the invite, you don't get the invite, suddenly you feel a little bit different. Suddenly you got some questions, and you start asking yourself some questions, why didn't I get invited? Or maybe, maybe I'm not that kind of friend that I thought I was that, to that person. Or, or maybe you did something that disqualified you, disqualified you from being invited to this. And, and this, let me just put it out there. De- depending on the occasion, sometimes you don't get invited and you think God really loves you because you didn't get invited and you don't have to go to that event. I'm just saying everybody's family dynamic is different. Okay, and so we see this. You know, the the other day I, I was sitting at my computer and I was opening up some emails and and I received this email, this invitation that said that I, Donovan Castle, have been personally invited to join the Queen in celebrating her 70th year of reign. I got so excited. I called Shelley into the office. I'm like, Charles, I got invited to join Her Majesty in celebrating her 70th year and only to realize that as I read on, it was Virgin Atlantic using this occasion as an opportunity to enhance their business. And I soon realized that I was not invited to be in the presence of Her Majesty. And so I realized that it was her loss, not my loss. But anyway, this this is what it is, okay? And the Bible says that Jesus is going through Jericho. And Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming, and and so Zacchaeus does what he needs to do so that he can see Jesus, and he can see what Jesus is doing, and hear what Jesus is saying, and and Zacchaeus realizes that a person like him was not going to be invited to a dinner with Jesus. In actual fact, all the odds were against Zacchaeus. Uh, Zacchaeus' odds of being invited to join Jesus at a special event was as good as my odds of joining Her Majesty for dinner. And so Zacchaeus realized that he's unable to make it. And the reason is, is that Zacchaeus is a tax collector. And tax collectors in those days were very, very interesting people. In fact, the tax collectors were not very people that were very liked in society. They they were interested in because the fact is is that they they were Jewish people that that worked on behalf of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had put demands, financial demands on the citizens or the people that lived in the land. And so the Jews would have to pay their taxes to Rome and and they would pay them through an agent and that agent would be a Jewish person. And so what they would do is that whatever the tax of the land was, the tax collectors would come and collect. They would have to go pay their tax to that tax collector But then what would happen is the tax collector would put a commission on it and they would earn some money and line their pockets with the money from the Jews. And so the Jews looked at the people, the tax collectors, and they viewed them as traitors because they were were working on behalf of Rome who was suppressing them and they were making money out of them. It's like this. It's like you have to pay your your monthly income tax to SARS and and SARS decides they're going to change the system and they're going to use a family member in your family to collect on their behalf and they are going to make money off collecting tax from you. Suddenly the family dynamic changes. Suddenly that person that was so close to you and you had a relationship is now using you to make money for their lives. And so this was the life of a tax collector. They would line their pockets with the money of their, from their own people. And so Zacchaeus, when he sees Jesus, he's on the back foot because firstly, he's rejected by his own people. And secondly, he's not gonna get invited to see Jesus because not only is he a tax collector, but the Bible says he is short. 
And I think of all of the ways to describe, describe Zacchaeus, the Bible chooses to say that he was short. So it would be that, that if, he, if he wasn't a tax collector, the odds were, were he was not going to see Jesus because Jesus would have overlooked him in the crowd because he was short. So he decides that what he's going to do when he hears Jesus coming is he's going to have a different approach. He decides that he's going to climb a tree so that he can see Jesus because he knows a rabbi like Jesus would not be having, be having an opportunity to meet with him. And so he climbs the tree in order to experience Jesus, to see Jesus. Can I just tell you right there, there's a sermon right there. He climbed the tree. Some of us, we gotta learn to climb the tree. Some of us, we have the odds that are against us, but the odds against you don't define you. What you gotta do is you gotta learn to rise above the crowd, you gotta learn to rise above the circumstances, and you gotta learn to start climbing the tree so that you can do what you need to do in order for God to meet you where you're at. And so sometimes we can become a victim to life. We can become a, a product of our environment and we can use that as a reason why we can't get ahead. I wanna encourage us, we gotta rise above so that God can move in our life. Can I tell you that most times in scriptures where people have an encounter with God or an encounter with Jesus, they had to push through. They had to rise above their circumstances. And sometimes we believe that we just got to sit here and God is going to do everything. No, no, you got to do what you can do so God can do what you can't do. And so what happens is in the Bible, it says that the woman with the issue of blood, that when she heard that Jesus was coming into town, she shouldn't have been in the crowd. The Bible says there was a massive crowd all around her. What did she do? She pushed through the crowd. She made sure that she could do what she needed to do and she touched the garment of Jesus. She received her healing. Naaman, the... The, the general in the army, he, he, he needed healing. And the Bible says that they told Naaman to go to the, the Jordan and dip himself seven times in the Jordan. And when he did that, he got healed of his leprosy. We see this throughout scripture the, at the gate, beautiful, that when Peter and John are walking, that the, the beggar that was begging that was lame, the Bible says, Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none, but whatever I have, stand up in the name of Jesus and walk. The, the beggar had to get up. You have to do something in order for God to move in our life. And so often we, we be allow our life, whatever's happened in our nation, whatever's happened in our life, to determine the future and define our, this destiny that God has for us. Can I encourage us as a church? Let's not be a church that fits into the crowd and gets lost into the crowd. We gotta be people who climb the tree, that say, you know what, I'm gonna rise above so that I can overcome and I can get what God has for my life because God has something significant for our lives, amen? And if you're gonna grow in God and see all that God wants to do in your life, you gotta to learn to climb. You need to learn to rise above the circumstances. You gotta push the lid of limitation so God can lift it. Sometimes you just gotta push it a bit and when you push it, God lifts it. And so often it's so easy for you and I to lift, live with limitations, live with circumstances that are trying to hold us down. But God needs you to do what you can do so He can do what you can't do. And it's when we trust God and we do what his word says and apply it to the areas of our life that we start to experience what only he can do in our life. I want to encourage us as a church that we step out in faith, that we live a life that's believing, that's trusting, a, a, a life that, that is not defined by, by everything that's happening around us, but that we, we're not passive, but we trust in God, that if God's word says it can happen, it can happen in our life. That we've got to be active in our faith. That we've we got to be like Zacchaeus. You know what? I know I'm short. I know I'm, I'm a tax collector. I know that I shouldn't be here. I know that the society has put a label on me. I know that I've got a reputation. I know that, that God in His greatness and His, His wisdom created me to be short. But I'm not going to allow that. I'm not going to allow that to determine what can happen in my life. And so often we just accept everything that happens in life. And we accept it as God's plan for our life. Sometimes you just got to rise up and say, God, I'm going to climb that tree. I want to experience you. I want to know that you're real in my life and working in my life. Can I say this? Zacchaeus, this is what I love about him, is that he decided that he was not going to use the limitations and the labels that people had put on his life to prevent him from seeing Jesus. He was interested in seeing Jesus more than what people had to say about him. And can I carry, say this to us? That's why we need to focus more on who Jesus is and what Jesus is saying to us more than what people are saying about us. 
I want to encourage us, don't allow the labels of society and don't allow the limitations on your life to determine what God can do in your life. Have you noticed how easily we can get shaken by what people say about us? How, how we can just get stopped in our tracks from doing something good when, when somebody says, that's who you are, that you're always like that, you always do this. It puts a label on us. I want to encourage us today, we've got to remove the labels and we've got to, we've got to see what God says about us. Sometimes it's the people that are closest to us that can, can put the limitation on us or put the cap on us. I want to encourage us. God is coming to remove the labels and the limitations of our life. Don't allow the future and the destiny that God has for your life to be determined by a childhood label or a limitation that you have for your life. Our God is a God who can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than what we could ever ask or imagine in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, give him some praise today, amen. When Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he made a decision. He made a decision not to allow what people said about him and the labels and his own personal limitations to determine what God could do in his life. And it's interesting to know that the name Zacchaeus means innocent. Yet Zacchaeus is living a life that does not reflect his name. He's not living the life that portrays his true identity. And Jesus comes in onto the scene. And even though Zacchaeus thought he was climbing up to see Jesus, Jesus had already seen Zacchaeus. And I want to encourage us today. Jesus comes on to the scene into Zacchaeus' life. And he's about to change Zacchaeus' life. He's about to restore Zacchaeus. He's about to do something in Zacchaeus' life that Zacchaeus has never experienced. Jesus looked beyond his reputation and he saw the person. And I want to encourage us where God sees us right where we are. He sees us with the labels that have been put on us. But he looks beyond the label and the limitation and he sees the person that he's created in his likeness and his image. You see, Jesus saw Zacchaeus looking for him. And like I say, God sees you and I. And he extends an invitation to you and I, just like he did to Zacchaeus, to say, hey, I wanna come to your house. I wanna be a part of your life. I wanna be involved in your home. And I wanna, I wanna, Make my presence known to you, amen? And can I say this is that sometimes in our own life, we get so caught up with the busyness of life. We get so caught up with what, what we're doing in our own agenda and our own plans and our own purposes. And, and we get caught up by what people are saying or what the labels that, that, have, that have been put on us. And we get distracted from seeing that, that Jesus is wanting to do something. He's wanting to move in our life. He's wanting, he's wanting to be a part of our lives and come into our life. Can I say that it was not that Zacchaeus was perfect and was legible for an invitation from the Creator. The difference with Zacchaeus and everybody else was that Zacchaeus was responding to the fact that Jesus was coming and doing what he did. And he opened up his heart to God. And as a result, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. I want you to know today that God wants to come to your house. God wants to have a moment with you. He's inviting you to open up your life, to have an experience with him. You see, Jesus accepted Zacchaeus. Jesus accepted Zacchaeus in the condition that he was, and he extended an invitation to him regardless of his reputation. And can I say this, is that acceptance opens the door. You see, because Jesus accepted Zacchaeus as the tax collector, as somebody who was short, as somebody who did something out of the norm. He opened the door for Jesus to say, Zacchaeus, I wanna come into your life. I wanna come to your house. You see, the first thing that happens is that when we experience God, what we need to know about the nature of Jesus and the nature of God is that acceptance precedes change. Acceptance, this is what I know about us in our humanity is that often in order for us to accept somebody, we want them to change. We want them to be like us, to speak like us, to behave like us, to walk like us, to be like mini-me's. But the truth is this, is that Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus accepts us. Acceptance precedes change. And the moment that he accepts Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus opens the door for Jesus to come into his life. And Jesus accepts him as he is. And can I say this, is that God does this with all of us. He does this with us and often we think that we have to be something and we put pressure on ourselves to be somebody that we're actually not at the moment. And can I just say that the best thing that we can know about the nature and character of God is that you don't have to perform to be accepted. 
You don't have to put on a face, a Sunday church face, to have a moment with God. In actual fact, can I say this? The more authentic you are with God, the more you will experience God. The more real you are and say, you know what, God, I know I'm a tax collector. I know I've got this disability, God. I know I've got this dysfunction in my life. The more real and authentic we are, the more power of God we'll experience in our life. And Jesus accepts Zacchaeus. Before he wants to change him. Jesus doesn't change him and say, okay, Zacchaeus, before I come to your house, you need to, you need to pay back everybody and you need to stop stealing from your own people. Jesus is like, I'm coming. I know you do that. I know that's what your life is, but I've accepted you. And can I tell you, when you know that you're accepted, it changes your life. Because one of the greatest things that we all want in life is to be accepted. That's why we do crazy things just to fit into a group. That's why we'll go to places we know we shouldn't go just so that people can, can I, can I just be real? We want people to accept us. But the reality is this, is that when we know we've been accepted by the creator of the universe and that he wants to come to your house, suddenly I don't have to perform. I know the flaws that I have and I know that even though I've got that flaws, God is not finished working with me. He's still doing, I'm still a project. I'm still under his surgery. He's still working in my heart. He's still gonna move in my life. And I know that, listen, as Joel Osteen used to say, I thank God. I'm no, I know I'm not where I need to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. And I wanna encourage us today that so often in our own personal lives, we feel like we have to, we have to be something before God can do something. But look what the scripture says, Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so many times we wanna, we wanna change people, or we wanna, we wanna make people be a specific way before they can come. And can I just say this, is that that's not how God's kingdom works. God says, come as you are. So no, before you come to church, you, you gotta dress like that, and you gotta change that. The, gee, that's not how God works. He accepts us the way we are. You see, it's like, it's like me saying to you, you know what, I'm, I'm, I've been outside and I've been walking through the rain and I've got mud all over me and I need to get bathed and I, I need to get myself cleaned up. But before I jump into the bath, I'm gonna run the bath and I'm gonna get the bath ready. But before I jump in the bath, I'm actually gonna clean myself first. That's defeating the object of the bath. You don't clean yourself to get into the bath. You get into the bath so you can clean yourself. You don't have to come here all cleaned up. You come here so God can clean us up that he can work in us, that he can do his work that he needs to do in our life. And so often, can I believe that? I believe the church would be a lot more effective if we learn to accept before we start to change. So often that we can be a church that, and I pray that we never become this church that, that when in order for you, to, for you to do this, you have to do that. Allow God to do the work. We gotta do the accepting. Jesus accepted Zacchaeus just as he is. Is this making sense to you today? You see, number one is this, is that acceptance precedes change. The second thing is this, is that acceptance prepares our hearts. It prepares our hearts. You see, as Jesus accepted Zacchaeus as he was, he opened up his heart, he opened up his life, and he opened up his house so that Jesus could come in. You see, when we realize that God has accepted us and he loves us unconditionally, and that we, we cannot win God's approval through our actions because God loves us in spite of our actions. We realize that God loves us unconditionally. It change, changes how we approach God. It changes how we give our hearts to God. And that's why the Bible teaches us is that sometimes in life things happen to us and things can get into our hearts and disappointments can get into our hearts and people can let us down or somebody says something or, or somebody behaved in a way that they shouldn't have behaved. And, they, and listen, you've got every legitimate reason to feel like I should cut that off and I should, the Bible says, guard your heart. Guard your heart because out of your heart come the issues of life. Flow, everything that happens in your life is a result of what's happened in your heart. And so you gotta guard your heart. Church, can I tell you, in this day and age that we're living in, people are gonna say things, people are gonna do things, people are gonna disappoint you. You might be get rejected, you might be betrayed, you might feel like people have taken advantage of you. You gotta guard your heart above all else. You gotta guard your heart. You see, acceptance prepares our hearts. And then the third thing that happens is, when there's acceptance, is that acceptance produces repentance. You see, there's a progression. The progression is simply this, is that you come as you are. And when you know that you're accepted unconditionally, you're willing to open up. 
You're willing to experience who Jesus is. You're willing to have a moment with God. But the reality is this, is that the moment that Jesus came into Zacchaeus' life, there was a change in Zacchaeus' life. There was a change that took place in him. And the evidence of God in his life was simply this, is that I'm going to live my life differently to the way I used to live. That I'm going to go on a different course to the course that I was on. In actual fact, the Bible says, he says this, that if I've cheated people of their taxes, then I'm going to pay them back four times the amount that I've taken from them. And this is an incredible story because this was Zacchaeus. He was saying that the very thing that he specialized in is that he was specializing in taking money from people. And in one moment, he says to God, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to give back everything that I've ever taken from somebody. This is what Jesus said. This man is a true son of Abraham. That means that he's a true son of God because there's been repentance. There's, at the point of acceptance, there was a change of life. And so often, can I just say this, is that this is God's plan for our life. This is the genius of God. The genius of God is this, is that God's plan for our life is that He accepts us the way we are. And He loves us in the condition that we come. But He loves us too much to leave us the way we are. And this is throughout Scripture. This is a theme throughout Scripture. When Moses encountered God at the burning bush, his life was transformed. He went from being a wanderer in the desert to becoming the deliverer of Israel. This is what happened to Isaiah when he saw the face of God, that he, he repented of his sinful life and, and he said, Lord, send me, Lord, be, let me be used by you. This is what happened to Saul who was, who was persecuting the church and he was trying to destroy Christians, killing Christians and trying to stop the movement of, of Jesus in this world. And, and the moment he had a, 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 an experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life was transformed. The Bible says that he, he, had a, he had a moment with God and, and in that moment, his eyes were open to see who Jesus is and, and then he became the greatest preacher in the New Testament and church builder that we've ever known. There was a change. And can I encourage us today that God invites you and I into a relationship. He invites you and I to, to be a part of what he's doing and he accepts us as we are. But the moment we experience Jesus, the moment we have a moment with God, is that there is an evidence that God is working in our life that causes us to, to repent and to turn from what we cus work, was customary in our life to now following God's way. This is the mystery of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel, is that you come as you are, but you don't stay the same as you are. It's the paradox of the cross. The paradox of the cross is anybody can come, no matter what your past is, no matter what your pain is, no matter what the baggage is, or, or the disappointments and the failures and the things that haven't worked out. You come as you are, but the moment you encounter the cross and the person of the cross, your life is changed. Your life is changed to see a different kind of future that God has for you. Romans 2, 4 says this, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? The Bible says that the goodness of God, and it's the kindness of God that invites us into salvation and relationship, but it's not only the kindness that saves us, it's his kindness that promotes, that, that, that kind of provokes us and moves us to want to change and to turn our life on the life that we used to live. And this is why at Imagine Church, we believe that, that God has a, a specific journey for each and every single one of us, and that journey's made up in four stages. And in fact, this is the story of the children of Israel when God delivered them from Egypt. This is exactly what God intended for them to go through and experience. The first thing is that God saved them. He delivered them from Egypt, and then He was taking them on to the promised land. And what he was doing is that he wanted to set them free from the life of Egypt so they could possess the promise that God had and the future that God had. And so they could be, the purpose was that they would be able to be a, an example to all the nations of the world of what it looks like to be blessed by God. And I believe God does the same in our lives. In the New Testament, we see this at work in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9. It says this in 2 Timothy 1, 9. The scripture says, he saved us, he called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And these are the four things that God wants to do in our life. Number one is this, is that he saves us. And then the second thing is that he calls us, that we've been called. And the third, third thing is that we, we've been purposed by God and we have God's grace. We've been graced by God. And so simply means, to talk, when we talk about saved, it simply means to know God. To have a relationship with God. That you would not have a relationship with God through a third party or an inherited faith. But Jesus would be real to you. 
that Jesus, you have that personal relationship with him and, and that no matter what you, you've been through, that no matter where you are, that you, God accepts you the way you are. You can come as you are and, and he saves you. Can I just say this, church? We cannot earn our way into heaven. We cannot earn our way. We can't pay for our salvation through, through giving. We can't, we can't earn it through works. We can only be saved by God's grace and his power. That's why Ephesians 2 says this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And can I say, this is the first part of God's plan for your life. Number one is that God saves you. And can I say this, is that so many Christians, they stop at this. Can I say salvation is not just the ticket to heaven. It's just the beginning of the story that God has for your life. That God has so much more for you than just salvation. God wants you to live effective. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to experience all that he has. He wants you to live the abundant life here on earth. But it goes beyond just being saved. It goes beyond just saying, I know God. It's about you and I experiencing all that he has, amen. And can I say this, that salvation has the power to save us, but it also has the power to change us. And that's why we gotta go to the next step. And we gotta live called. And when we start to live called, that's when we start to realize God's word has power in our life. When we start to live called and we start to realize that God has saved me. You see, to be called means that you're no longer trapped in your old life. And this is what, can I just say this, like most people, they experience salvation, but they get stuck here, is that they don't experience the freedom God has for them. And so God doesn't want you to be saved and then live in a prison of your past. God doesn't want you carrying around that pain, that hurt, that divorce, that all of those things that have happened, and even in your present, he wants you to be set free. And when you have freedom, you can enjoy your relationship with God. You see, God wants you and I to experience freedom. And one of the ways that we've experienced freedom is by following God's plan. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. All old things are passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. So maybe you were one way when you came to Jesus and you experienced the cross. At the moment you said yes to Jesus and you welcomed him into your life, you know what happened? He made you new. You're not the same person you used to be. You may still have one or two of those characteristics, but in God's eyes, inside you have a new spirit. Your spirit is alive to God. And the, the things that used to define you are not the things that define you. Now God defines your life. You find freedom. He sets you free. And can I say this, church, please don't live the rest of your life in a prison that God has set you free from. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. If God has set you free, can I say this? God has set you free, but you and I have to learn to walk in that freedom. And the way we learn to walk in that freedom is by deliberately saying no to some things. By deliberately saying, you know what? I, if I want to have freedom from that, I've got to turn my back on that. That's not God's best for my life. You see, we, can I just say this? We love the fact that acceptance precedes change. We love the fact that acceptance opens up the door for God to come in. But most of us, we get stuck here. When we realize that we've been saved, that there is an evidence of salvation in our life by the fact that we repent. And repentance is a, it, it seems like it's become a dirty word in, Christian, in Christianity because the world is teaching us and this theology is coming to the church. Well, God loves me just the way I am and I can live the way I can. There's nowhere in the scripture you find that. And repentance is part of a distinguishing mark of a believer. That when I mess up and I do something that's contrary to God, God, I say, I'm sorry, Lord. God, I'm sorry, and I turn, I'm, I'm making a, an effort, Lord, in the power that you've given me to walk in a different direction. And we want to experience freedom. Because can I tell you right now, you can't experience all God has with you if you're still trapped in your past. You can't experience the blessing of God when, and you can't fulfill the God-given purpose for your life when, when you're still carrying who you used to be. God sets you free. You see, God saves us, He calls us, and He purposes us. That God has given you and I a purpose. Every single one of us in this room, you have a purpose. And your purpose is not what you do from a Monday to a Friday. My purpose is not just to preach the gospel. I have a primary purpose. And that primary purpose is to live for God in everything I do. That purpose is that when I'm at home and I'm raising my children, I'm, I'm, I'm raising them for the glory of God. That when I'm dealing with my finances, I'm, my purpose is to bring honor to God and I'm being a good steward of what you've given me, Lord. 
my purpose in my marriage is to make sure that I'm loving my wife and doing what I, I need to do, even though sometimes we make mistakes and we fall and we stumble. But my purpose is, God, I'm, everything I do is to bring worship to you. You see, can I tell you something that we can do our purpose for one of two things? Our purpose can either be for the worship of God, everything I do is for you, God, or it can be for me. And whenever I'm doing it for me, it never ends off well. Whenever I'm doing it for me, I'm not, I'm not going to see the blessing of God. But when I decide, God, I'm, I'm just going to do it to bring glory and honor to God. I'm going to answer the phone at work as a receptionist for the glory of God. God, I'm going to worship you in the way I treat my customers, God. I'm going to worship you, Lord, in, in the way I manage my time and get to the office on time. And can, I, can I say this is what it means that when God is working in us, we become different. We look different. We speak different. It's our attitude towards life. We, we live a cold life and we got purpose. And then ultimately, we experience the grace of God, which is God's power to bring change into our life. It's God's power that when we're weak, He is strong. And when we can't, He can. We experience that. And that's what God wants you and I to experience. And can I say as a church, no matter how old you are yeah, in the room, no matter how long you've been born again, you might have known Jesus for one week. You might have given your life to Him last week over the Easter weekend. Welcome to God's family. He accepts you the way you are. And you, you might be in the room and you might be saved for over 20 years. Can I tell you sometimes the hardest people to convince are the people that have been saved the longest because you start serving God from your head instead of your heart. And don't allow yourself to be trapped when you've been called to be set free. In Jesus' name. Jesus came and he said, long before Zacchaeus saw Jesus, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. And can I say, it's the same today. Long before you would experience God, he already saw you because he loves you. And this is the power of the gospel that you can come as you are. And maybe today you don't have a personal relationship with God. Maybe you don't know him as, as Lord and Savior. You haven't opened up your heart to him. You haven't opened up your life to him. I want to tell you the greatest thing that could ever happen is that you could have a relationship with the one who created you. That you could have a relationship with the God of this universe. And he's personal. When you reach out to him, he comes into your life. And all you got to do doesn't matter what you've been through. You're, can I tell you right now, you could have been a murderer, you could have been a drug lord, you could have been a, whatever, whatever label society has put on you or what you've put on yourself. At the cross, you're accepted. And you, all you've got to do is say, Lord, I need you in my life today. Right now, if that's you. Maybe you've never made that decision. I want to give you an invitation. And on the count of three, right where you are, just where you're sitting, I just want to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. Just, just want to identify who you are. And so I want to say a prayer over you right where you are in your seat today. If that's you, on the count of three, raise your hand. Number one, the Bible says, every head bowed, every eye closed. The Bible says that, that, that for God so loved the world, He gave His Son Jesus. You need to know today, God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. The second thing, all you got to do is come as you are and say, God, here I am. I need you in my life. I want to invite you into my life. If that's you now, three, just raise your hand right where you are right now. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand at the back there. Anybody else that would say, yeah, that's me. Please would you include me? Thank you. Thank you. Just keep your hands up high right where you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you on the sides. Thank you. Thank you in the middle, yeah. Thank you at the back there. Anybody else? Maybe you're in the room today and you say, you know what? I want to recommit my heart. I want to recommit my life to God today. I want to come back into a relationship with Jesus if you want to recommit your life today, just raise your hand and I'm going to include you in this prayer as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to pray this prayer over your life right now. I just want you to believe these words as I pray them. Father God, we thank you so much that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. So today, Jesus, we open up our lives to you. We open up our hearts to you. And we ask you to come into our lives today. Jesus, we thank you that you died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins and that today you accept us as we are. But God, we ask you that you would work in our lives, that, that salvation that would come into our lives today would, would not just save us, but it would empower us to live the life that you've called us to live. And so today, Jesus, we ask you to be the Lord and Savior of our life. We ask you to lead us and guide us, and we surrender our lives to you today, and we follow you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give those people a great hand. If you raised your hand today, I want to encourage you to 
uh, after the service that if you'd maybe just give us two moments of your two minutes of your time as you go through the back doors we've got a sign that says next step on the on the left hand side our team is there ready to connect with you and and we want to put a bible in your hand get you started on this journey I want to encourage you to to come back to the house of god and and everybody in the house today i just want to uh, i encourage you as well you know we just finished our as pastor shelley said we just finished our first week uh our first kind of section of grow nights and we start in the new, the new kind of week section this week, coming on Tuesday night. There's some great courses that you can uh, just put into your life and allow God to grow you and just allow God to work in your life. And so I want to encourage you to register. It's going to be a good time in God's house. You can connect with other people, grow in faith and, and be a part of what God is doing. God bless you, church, as you go today. Thank you for coming to church. We'll see you next week. Have a great week. for joining today's service. If you decided to follow Jesus, follow the link on screen. Don't forget to register for one of our on-campus services as well as keeping up to date with our social media. See you next week.